a lot of us wrestle with this. This is just something that I minor in is that you're amazing at starting new projects. You get excited, but then you're not the best at actually completing them because you get excited about the next shiny object. And so you go on to the next thing before you've actually finished this one. And a lot of times those go hand in hand with the army ant. So I major in army ant and minor in squirrel, but I can definitely identify with all four of them. For sure. It's one small step for man. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We off. choose to go to the moon, not because they are easy, but because they I are I have hard. a dream. You can't handle the truth. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Super, 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 super. Super you. Good morning. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Super You Podcast. It's the podcast designed to unlock and unleash your superpower. I'm Jake with Equal Man Studios. This week's quote is be like bamboo. The climate which bamboo grows naturally, monsoons and hurricanes are common, but it always seems to survive the storm and continues to grow. Compare that scenario to a pine tree. A minor storm snaps off branches and sometimes blows the tree over entirely. Be like bamboo. Learn to bend rather than break and continue to grow even when circumstances change. For today's episode, we're sharing an interview between Eric Qualman and Andy Kaufman from the People and Projects podcast. Eric talks about how one of the biggest challenges we face in day-to-day living is staying focused, and he offers tips to help fight back against those challenges. Andy Kaufman is the host of the People and Projects podcast, which provides interviews and insights to help listeners lead people and deliver projects. Andy is an international speaker, author, executive coach, and president of the Institute for Leadership Excellence and Development Incorporated. His keynotes, workshops, and executive coaching services have reached tens of thousands of people from hundreds of companies all over the world. Thank you for having us on the podcast, Andy. And thank you to all of our listeners. Keep those five-star reviews coming. Here we go. Enjoy this interview between Eric Qualman and Andy Kaufman. Hi, this is Andy. You know, one of the biggest challenges we face in day-to-day living is staying focused. I mean, there's so many things vying for our attention. In fact, right now, even as you're listening to this episode, you're probably doing something else, right? I mean, like driving or working out or going for a walk, maybe even going through email. Our mobile devices and watches, they vibrate, colleagues stop by or they message us and either way, it can be an interruption whether it's the latest news, sports scores, social media, email, messaging, and more, we live in a world that struggles with focus. Well, to help fight back against those challenges, I'm excited to introduce you to Eric Quammen, author of a book entitled The Focus Project. In today's discussion, Eric will share about a year-long project he undertook to be more focused. It was his focus project. We'll talk about a question that if you ask it strategically and regularly, it'll fuel incredible growth for you and your career. You're going to learn what cowboy scheduling is and how it helps you stay more focused. Eric will share some ideas on the power of saying no, but also how do you say it in a way that doesn't come off as you're being lazy or not a team player. And if you're listening to this as you're trying to sleep, well, Eric's got some sleep advice for us today as well. And he'll even share some ideas of how parents can help their kids be more focused. It's a conversation I'm looking forward to sharing with you. A quick note, I want to invite you to join our Lead 52 family. It's a global group of leaders who are committed to transforming our ability to lead and deliver. It's 52 weeks of leadership learning delivered right to your inbox, taking less than five minutes a week. It's all for free. Learn more and sign up at getlead52.com. Well, let's jump in today's discussion with Eric about his book, The Focus Project. Eric, thank you for joining us on the People and Projects podcast. No, thank you for having me. It's great to join all your listeners out there as well. Looking forward to the discussion. You know, before we get into the book, I'd love for our listeners to learn more about you, Eric. I mean, you made a very personal book, which I appreciated. In what ways might your parents or family culture growing up influenced you when it comes to this area of being focused? Yeah, I mean, when I grew up in Michigan, one thing, and we just talked about this before the show, is that I was fortunate to walk on the basketball team at Michigan State University, which Coach Tom Izzo is a Hall of Fame coach. And so his whole message is defend, rebound, run, right? And that's the culture. So for over three decades, he just ingrains that, never gets tired, defend, rebound, run. That's the focus. There's a lot of other things you can focus on in basketball. 
Let's just focus, defend, rebound, and run. So being from the Midwest, having the opportunity to play for Coach Tom Izzo just reminded me, get back to the basics, those first principles. Yeah. Make sure you focus on the big versus the busy. Yeah, and I got the impression, you mentioned your parents at least once or twice as soon as you were calling the book, and they gave you all kinds of positive messages about stuff as well, I mean, as you are growing up. Oh, yeah, very fortunate, very fortunate. I grew up in Michigan, and, you know, my first entree into entrepreneurship was actually selling marigold seeds door to door. So selling marigold seeds door to door, 50 cents in a Dixie cup. But yeah, my parents have been amazing. So my parents, number one, and then Coach Tom Izzo, just the, the right kind of values, those Midwest values. It's been a great ride. Yeah. On a scale of one to 10, where 10 is you are naturally laser focused and one is you're naturally an easily distractible squirrel, <laughs> where would you rate yourself? And by the way, since you talk about your family a lot, where would your wife rate herself on that same scale? Ah, interesting. I'd say that I'd give myself a four just because I'm one of those folks that like, I want to do it all. You know, I think <laughs> that honestly, heaven is just you have unlimited time. Mm -hmm. And so that's the luxury, right? Luxury is that you have time. Mm -hmm. So I give myself a four in general and I give my wife a six. Yeah, okay. She's trying to give herself a six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you have the categories of the different sort of personalities and you, you say you're an army ant. I think a lot of people that are listening to us would call themselves these army ants, which you define as, as I understood it. We just, we like to say yes, right? It's like, let's do it. We can do it. And we maybe take on more than what we think. And so is that a little bit you? Yeah. No, I mean, we talk about four, there's four focus animals in the book. And when I go over these, I'm going to go over them super fast right now, but everyone listening, you'll be able to identify with probably all four, but really you major in one and minor in the other. So the four are, as you mentioned, there's the army ant. An army ant, if you don't know, they can carry 10,000 times their weight, right? So the strongest animal on the planet. So an army ant, us as a focused animal, we take on too many things at once because we can, like we can do it, but it doesn't mean we should do it because we actually, it takes us longer to get all of them done. And think about the army ant, you have so much you're carrying, you can't get it into the hole, right? You can't get it back home. So that's what an army ant struggles with. You're parallel processing a bunch of stuff rather than you're better off just focus on one thing at a time. If you're a chameleon, you're a people pleaser. So all these are positive things, but it's to an extreme. So that you're a people pleaser, like, oh, I should stay in this job because I know that my wife likes the hours. Or, you know, I'm going to go into this vocation because I think it'll make my parents happy. And so you're a people pleaser to an extreme. And so it's a benefit to you, but then you take it to the extreme. You're never thinking about yourself. You don't focus on yourself enough. If you did, you'd actually be better for everyone around you as well. The third one's the hedgehog. Hedgehog someone that's out there. If you're listening, you're like, yeah, I have an idea to write a book, but first I've got to do this. I got to make sure I have time. I've got to get a PhD in writing. Right. And so in hedgehogs, again, there's positive folks. Hedgehogs, like if you're a lawyer, your job is basically to say no. And so when they come to you, hey, we got to put all of our investments in crypto, you're like, maybe not all of them, you know? And so a hedgehog, though, your detriment, though, the things keeping you back is that you think you need to do X, Y, and Z before you actually start and start on that focus. And so it's really about making sure you, you get there and step in it. And then you mentioned the squirrel. A lot of us wrestle with this. This is just something that I minor in is that you're amazing at starting new projects. You get excited, but then you're not the best at actually completing them because you get excited about the next shiny object. And so you go on to the next thing before you've actually finished this one. And a lot of times those go hand in hand with the army ant. So I major in army ant and minor in squirrel. But I can definitely identify with all four of them. For sure. Yeah. Give me the right day and I could be any one of them for sure. Yeah. You know, the Focus Project is not just the name of a book for you, right? I mean, it was an actual project for you. So give us the backstory of how this book came to be. So for those that don't know me, I started my career in tech. And then about 12 years ago, I fell into the space of writing. So I wrote a book called Social Nomics about how social media would change the way we live and do business. This is when my space was bigger than Facebook. So everyone thought that it was just for teenagers. And so right time, right place, that book takes off. And then so the last 12 years, I've been writing books, I've written six books, and I speak on stage around the world to work with companies to help them out with their focus and also with their digital leadership. Those go hand in glove, digital leadership and focus. But what was happening for me is that, so I own a small company, I own an animation studio, I do the books, I own some web properties. So in theory, I control my own time because I'm the owner, right? In theory, everyone reports to somebody. <laughs> so everyone reports to somebody. But what was funny is that at the end of each day, my hair was on fire. 
And I'm sitting there going, what the heck? Like, okay, I'm not going to do that again tomorrow. Like, I feel like I'm just chasing things left and right. And I'm just putting out fire after fire. This is no way to go about life. It literally is happening day after day. So finally I go, this is crazy. I got to stop the madness. What if I just, I started to get excited. What if this month that is focused on sales or next month that is focused on organizing my house or like how much would I get done if that was just the only thing I got up and thought about? Or if I only got up and thought about writing, how fast would the next book get done if that's the only thing that was on my mind? And so I, I sat there and I just would fantasize about it. And then I go, wait, let's do it. But then I go, okay, why haven't I been doing it? Because life exists. <laughs> you know, life happens to you. And so I go, let's make this practical. I can't just focus 100% of my time on writing. But what if I focus when I got up? an hour or two hours or a half an hour. And I go, okay, let's do this project. But then also it can become a book. So then I started thinking, well, can someone actually dedicate two hours a day to something? Maybe not. Maybe it should be a half hour. So for a year, basically, I failed doing the project because I'd go, okay, what's the number one thing I need to do? I've got to do sales, which for me is getting on stage to speak. And so that I can afford the other 11 months, like I can afford to invest in this project and see if it actually works. And so for literally a year, I had five false starts because I go, all right, I'm going to do two hours of sales a day. And at the end of the month, I looked at how much time did I do? Oh, 17 total month minutes for the month. <laughs> or, this is harder than I thought. Like, this is ridiculous. It wasn't 17 minutes a day. It was 17 minutes for the month. And so I go, all right. I finally clicked on the sixth time. And then away we went for the focus project. And then the short version, the Cliff Notes version is it did work because that first month, if our sales didn't increase, it was like, well, this doesn't work. These focus things that I'm testing. But fortunately, it did work. We had a record month of sales that month, but also we had a record amount of sales for the year just from that month. So that's how powerful this stuff is. Yeah. You know, when I first saw the book, I thought, man, I think this is too thick for a book on focus. But then it became really clear opening it. No, no, it's a chapter a month. And so it's really effective in that regard. And, you know, one of the months, actually, the first month is on growth, which you're talking about there. And part of that chapter is asking some version of this question. What's the one thing I must do well to make everything else easier or unnecessary? And so I've been passing this question by people. And a lot of times people go, oh, <laughs> so what's, what's the wisdom behind that question, Eric? And what are some examples of wins that you've seen people earn by asking that? Yeah. And again, repeat the question is, what's the one thing I need to do well to make everything else either easy or unnecessary? Because there's all of us out there. I know right now that you've got a super long to-do list. I mean, a ridiculously long one. Like if I gave you another lifetime, you wouldn't get it done. And so a lot of us have this misconception. And this one thing I learned is that it's not time management, it's energy management. Because me, if I gave you two more hours a day, you'd fill those. And so it's really, it's not the amount of time, maybe 48 hours in a day, you still would have more than you could get done to do. It's just the nature of the beast of us top performers that are out there. And this book is for people that are doing well. It's you might be hitting home runs, but you know, there's a grand slam out there for you. Mm -hmm. And or there's you've climbed that this mountain, but there's another summit for you to climb out there. And so when you think about that question, when you get up in the morning, what's the one thing if I do it well makes everything else either easier or necessary? That's the key. A lot of us, me included, on days even now, and I know better, I'll try to start to do the easy stuff. Rather than going, all right, let's tackle the one thing that's going to make everything else either easier or necessary. And I saw it firsthand when we did it that first month on sales. And so that's basically me outreaching to my contacts to start that process. And also our small team making sure that they're targeted, that they're not doing the busy, that they're also focused on that number one thing as a team. And that can be the hardest thing as well, because you want your team to do their thing, but they're going to fall into those traps as well. So sometimes you question yourself and go, wait, what is if I had my team of 10, 20, 40, 50, all targeted on the one thing? And they get excited about it too. So that's another thing that was a learning is that we saw some companies like Nissan in Mexico, they have a Daruma, this doll that if you've ever seen it, basically it starts with one eye open and then one eye you have to fill in. They passed out this Daruma doll to everyone in Mexico and said, here's our number one thing that we're going to focus on. Our number one thing is to reach out on a personal level to every contact we know from the dealership level to people that have Nissans and also anyone else we know in the community. And so Nissan was a top selling make of car in Mexico. Now keep in mind, they're like the 11th top seller in the United States. So think about their number one in Mexico 
just by having that kind of leadership and that focus. So kind of wild when you think about what's the one thing we do well, makes everything else either easier or necessary. It really kind of helps you focus on just that core principle of, you know, what it needs to get done. But by asking that question, it helps remind you each day. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, you know, while preparing for this discussion, I've been asking people, you know, how do you stay focused? So this morning I did a spin class at 545 in the morning. And the reason I even mentioned the time is the instructor. She's such a busy person. It's at that time because she's balancing a full-time job. She does all of her classes that she does. She's a mom and a wife. And I said, so how do you stay focused? She goes, I live by my calendar. I couldn't stay focused without it. And in your chapter on time management, you mentioned cowboy scheduling, which I'd never heard that term before. So what do you mean by that? And what are some examples, not for a business owner necessarily, but for a typical corporate employee, how could they apply cowboy scheduling? Yeah. So cowboy and cowgirl scheduling, it's think about the song, if you remember, wide open spaces. And so you've got to think about, you want to have times fenced off, like the spin instructor, she just has that fenced off 545. She knows where she's going to literally be on that seat on that bike. And so there's fencing off and there's also, you need to leave wide open spaces. That's the harder part because all of us just want to jam our calendar together. And that's interesting. If you look at Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, the difference between those two when they first met and they become friends. But when they first met, Warren literally will flip through this paper calendar and have five things scheduled for the month. (laughs) And Bill's kind of laughing, going, well, what kind of CEO are you? You know, isn't a CEO supposed to? And Bill's calendar is the opposite. He's like double booked throughout the day. And Warren's like, no, you need space to think. And so like in life, it's somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. But for those out there in the corporate world, I think about cowboy and cowgirl scheduling. What you want to do is fence off specific times for specific things. So let's say that you know that you're going to have to have some coffee meetings. Just try to make those in set times. Like these are the time, this is the block of time where I'm willing to take a break and have that coffee meeting. And then the wide open spaces, you've got to give time to think and me time. And it seems selfish, but you need to do that, especially in the corporate world. Just block off. Maybe it's your first hour of the day as much as you can. Obviously, your boss says you have to be in a meeting, but as much as you can, just block that off and put in. I've got to attack that one thing. And so do that before the day attacks you. So that's the best way. Fence off those specific times, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for certain things like coffee meetings, and then also leave some wide open spaces as much as you can. Yeah. I'm reminded of the time management principle. If you don't take responsibility for your time, other people are glad to do it for you. <laughs> and that's exactly. what I, I, I thought of that with that, you know, you know, fence it off and open spaces, yeah. have time to think. Yeah. 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 There's a meta theme throughout the book about, you know, reducing and minimizing and decluttering. And a couple of times you mentioned the power of saying no, which is easy in theory, but for the army ants of us out there, you know, we like to say yes. So what are some examples of things you have personally, Eric, said no to lately? (laughs) And what are some strategies that can help us be more effective at this? Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, one of those things. The strategy is is practice leads to progress. Mm -hmm. And so practice doesn't make perfect. That's completely false. (laughs) It's proper practice leads to progress. And improper practice can lead to the wrong kind of permanence or can lead to problems. And so just like say no, it takes practice. So start it out this weekend. If you had a restaurant, just simple things like, hey, do you want fries? No, thank you. And so (laughs) just start off because for a lot of us, it's hard for us to say no. And so start off with the simple ones and start to get that under your belt. And then over time, you've got to learn systems and processes. And so don't rely on willpower. And so, for instance, when saying no, it's for me, a lot of times like, hey, thank you for the opportunity. Fantastic. Unfortunately, it's a it's a no for me because I'm heads down on this book. And a lot of us like I used to do this, too. It's like I can't do it right now. Well, then you're going to get an email a month from now. Like a good rule of thumb is if it's not a hell yes, then it needs to be a hell no. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I've got two Super Bowl tickets. Do you want them? Hell yes. Hey, we're thinking about getting together on Thursday to go over this thing. And you're thinking, ah, maybe I should. I should probably do that. That should be a no. Like it should be immediate no. So if it's not a hell yes, it needs to be a hell no. And so when you think about that, then you have to put in place and start to practice those no's. And one thing it's interesting because at church, I volunteered to help with the kids school. I've got two daughters. And so, but I travel a lot. So when I do volunteer, I want to be the volunteer teaching one of my daughter's classes so I can spend time with them. Now, part of me is sitting there going, what kind of volunteer is this? It's like, you're just volunteering on how you want to volunteer. 
so I had to come to grips with that. But once I did, I'm like, no, no, I, I mean, I have a limited amount of time. I want to spend time with my daughters when I volunteer and help her classmates as well. And I would go, yeah, I can volunteer. And they go, oh, you know what? The boys don't have a teacher. Can you do the boys? And to be honest, the boys are a lot more difficult as well at that age. <laughs> <laughs> Elementary school boys are a little wilder. And so I'm sitting there going, in the past, before I did this project, I would have said, yeah, 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 I'm happy to do it. This time I said, no, actually, I travel a lot, I volunteer, I want to make sure I'm, I'm with my daughters. I'm happy to, to take on the girls. I'm happy to do the girls' class. And then thinking that dad had solved it, right? But then she comes back and she goes, you know, we really need someone in the boys. So she came back with that. And then I go, man, in the past, I would have caved and said, yep, I'll do it. But instead, I basically copy and pasted what I'd already written and then replied back with that. And she goes, okay, you're going to do the girls. This other volunteer that's going to do the girls, she's going to do the boys. And then this doesn't always work out like this. It's not all rainbows and unicorns, as my daughters would say. But the other volunteer, she actually enjoyed teaching the boys better. And she never taught the boys. And so it worked out to be great for everyone. That won't always be the case. But in this case, I was glad I held my ground and just kind of came back and very politely said, you know, this is what I want to do. And so that's the level you want to get to. But start with those small steps. Just start by saying no. And at first you might say, no, I can't do it now, but maybe in a couple months. Then you'll get better at not throwing out that couple months thing either. Yeah, that's a great example. Thanks for sharing that. You know, during your month of focus on health, one of the areas that you included was sleep. So first of all, how'd you sleep last night? <laughs> and second, <laughs> what are some ways you personally are trying? to manage your sleep habits. Yeah, no, I slept better last night. I mean, I just returned from Utah, so I was a little off on the time. Our flight landed at 2 a.m., so first world problems, but it can throw you off. So then you start, when you're used to that cowboy cowgirl scheduling, you're like, I right, get to bed at set time, life happens. So then you got to kind of adjust. But yeah, I mean, sleep's so important. I think that that was a big learning for me because a lot of us out there are like, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Well, you're basically, the saying's kind of true because you're killing yourself when you're not getting the proper sleep. And you're also being less efficient. A lot of us think of, like I said earlier, time management, is that if I get up two hours earlier, I'll actually might be less productive. The studies show I'm most likely I'm going to be less productive because my brain's just not functioning at full capacity. It's like you've had a couple of drinks when you don't have enough sleep. And you get into the neuroscience stuff, it's just fascinating. So sleep is a leadership tool or you can say like i'm gonna sleep my way to the top like ariana huffington always says i'm gonna sleep my way to the top because she's like that's her secret advantage right she's gonna be well rested her brain's gonna be firing and she went through that same process as well to where she actually fainted in a, in a meeting and landed on her face and had a lot of injuries from that and so it's literally people are starting to realize how important sleep is and that you're doing yourself a disservice when you're stealing from that bucket. So cowboy and cowgirl schedule to make sure you get the proper amount of rest. Most of us, that's eight hours. Some are like 0.00005% can get by with less sleep. Assume you're not that person. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. And you mentioned naps in that section too. And you know, uh, if I'm teaching an all day workshop, especially if I'm doing it virtually and it's like an hour break over lunch, I'll go in I'll just like a 15 minute, I'll set the alarm for 15. I'm amazed at how refreshed you can feel with something even under a half hour, right? Eh? Yeah, exactly. And if you don't fall asleep, sometimes just go in and lay down on a mat on the floor and meditate. And that'll actually give you more energy. But also when you meditate, it's the one way you can increase your gray matter in your brain, which also helps with your focus. And so even if you don't fall asleep, because if you're like me, someone's like, I need a nap. And I go in there, I'm like, come on, nap. I got 20 <laughs> minutes, nap. Come on, go ahead and nap. If you can get better at just kind of breathing and going, you know what? I might not fall asleep and I might have some weird thoughts coming to my head while I'm meditating. But as long as I try to stay with the process, I'll get better in time. Yeah. You know, people need to get a copy of the book for all of your ideas. But beyond anything else we've talked about, you have another piece of just favorite advice that you found is helpful for people who want to improve their focus. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to improving your focus, one of the most helpful things is the night before, just write down what's that one thing you need to do the following day that makes everything else either easier or unnecessary. Now, the reason you might want to do it at night is because then it your brain thinks that's been taken care of. So it's less like if you're like me, you're just everything's firing at night and you can't get to sleep. That gives you a fighting chance to like, OK, I've taken care of that. I've written it down and writing it down actually makes you more likely to do it. So that's why you write it down. So you've put it there, you've written it down. And so then you get up and you're not waking up going, huh, what should I do today? It's like, you know, that's that one thing you need to tackle before you do anything else. 
So that's some big advice that's helped me. Other advice is small steps lead to giant leaps. So if you, it's fascinating, if you slow down the frames of long jumpers at the Olympics, their shortest step is actually right before they launch themselves. So their shortest step is right before their giant leap. So it's a good metaphor for all of us is break things down into those small steps. Because it's super overwhelming if I were to sit here and go, I'm going to write a new book. That's crazy. But if you think about, I just need to write a sentence, then that's very helpful. Other tips that are really helpful, journaling really helps. But if you're like me, it's like, you know this. Like a lot of the information is, we know it. So knowledge isn't the problem. It's like, you want to get in better shape? Okay, eat healthier and exercise more. <laughs> it's not knowledge that's the issue. And so when it comes to journaling, I've always struggled with journaling because I just let days slip by where I just don't do it. And so for this one, it's like, I'm just going to write one sentence. And so write a sentence down. And then I even made that even shorter. If I didn't have time for a sentence, all I was going to do at the end of the day is I was going to write, was the day a plus one, plus two, plus three, or was it a minus one, minus two, minus three, never neutral. And then if I had time, I'd write a sentence to explain why it was a plus two and then explain why it was a minus two or minus one. And I do it in an Excel spreadsheet, actually a Google sheet. So then over time, I can start to see the patterns of what days were my best, what days made me the most fulfilled, the happiest. And you start to see those patterns. And then also it helps you in the moment mm -hmm. throughout the day, early in the morning at 11 o'clock. Let's say you've gotten off to a bad start. You pause and go, all right, I'm heading towards a negative two. <laughs> How do I get this to at least just a negative one? And so those are those small steps you can take throughout the day as well to kind of get you back on track. But it's really about being as present as possible and always asking yourself, what am I doing right now and what should I be doing? And having the guts to go, okay, that's a sunk cost, this thing I'm working on. I don't know why I was working on this. I don't know why I'm on this rabbit hole. I don't know why I got stuck in the social media, but I need to move on to the thing that I need to be doing. Yeah, those are all great. And there's so many more in the book. Yeah, you know, one last question, Eric, since you talk about your family a lot in the book, for those of us who are parents or those who hope to be someday, what are some things that you and your wife do to help raise focused kids? Yeah, with the kids, a good question to ask them. So you'll get home no matter what the age, you know, say, how was your day? Ah, good. You're not going to get any information with that kind of question. So you've got to ask better questions. That's with your kids, that's with other family members, it's for your friends, for your colleagues, your peers. Is good questions are the building blocks for great relationships. And so a good question to ask your children is, how'd you fail today? And what'd you learn from it? To encourage them to kind of fail, that it's okay to fail, that it's part of that process, that their focus isn't on the failure, but the focus is on what did I learn from that failure? What did I learn today? That's another question. What did you learn today? Other questions that probably a lot of parents do use, give me a thumbs up moment and a thumbs down moment from your day. So those are better specific questions. This is a great question for your kids, but it was a really good question for someone that works on your team is you don't ask them how you doing and they're gonna say good. Almost everyone's a people pleaser. They're gonna say good. You go to a restaurant, how's your food? It could be terrible. Most people are gonna say, great, we're fine. <laughs> and a good question to ask your kids, good question to ask your teammate is this one. It's one that I use probably the most. How are you doing on a scale of one to 10 and you can't say 10? So then whatever answer they give you, it's helping you because they're like they're at a nine. You're like, okay, this person's pretty well off. But you still have that narrow gap to ask, how do I get you to a 10? And they got to think through what that is. And then they give you that feedback, especially if you're a manager or a parent that allows you to help them more. Now in time with your teammates, what you want to ask is another question first. How are you doing on a scale of one to 10 in life? And then how are you doing on a scale of one to 10 at Equal Man Studios or whatever your company is? Be careful with that one. You got to have a good relationship with them. There's some HR violations you got to be careful of. But it's really about if you do it well, you're really looking out for that person because now you have context. Before, I would just ask, How you doing? One in 10 Eagleman Studios are like, all of a sudden they say a three. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this person hates working here. <laughs> she's going to quit and she's critical. But I found out she's broke up with her boyfriend. Mm. So you've got to have the context. That's why I always like to ask, How you doing in life? One in 10. And then follow up with, How you doing at Eagleman Studios on a scale of one in 10? Yeah, that's good. You know, for those listening, if you're looking to improve your ability to focus on the things that matter most, get a copy of Eric's book, The Focus Project. I put links to the book in the book's website in the show notes of this cast. So Eric, thank you so much for joining us on the People and Projects podcast. No, thanks for having me. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Seven. Six. Five.
Five, four, three, two, one. Super, 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 you. Oh, yeah. 